Good evening. Good evening. Very much welcome to the ESU online webinar. This time it's about metastatic hormone sensitive prostate cancer. We called it paradigm shifts, uh, recent treatment developments. And um, tonight we have two uh, famous presenters, Stefano Fanti, uh, nuclear medicine specialist from Bologna, and Professor Karim Fizazi from Field Juif in France, medical oncologist. And this is the program we have. Um, so we have about 10 minutes per presenter and then 10 minutes for questions uh, uh, afterwards. You can get one CME credit point when you look at this, uh, this webinar. Um, I have a few introductional slides. Uh, these are the last data from GlobalCon 2020. And here we see the incident rates of, of prostate cancer all over the world. And um, um, we, when we count all together, then there will be about 1.4 million new cases uh, per year. And how many of these will be metastatic hormone sensitive prostate cancer? I try to count a bit, and then I come to these data. Uh, I think that 60% will be localized, 20% will be locally advanced, and 20% will be, will be metastatic. But also from the first two groups, there will become patients metastatic. So altogether, it's about uh, 500,000 new cases per year. So that's an enormous market we are uh, uh, looking at. Well. I had the idea that I was talking a bit about the uh, uh, PSMA scanning and what kind of scanning we, what kind of imaging we have uh, right now. And we used to have um, um, bone scans and we did the horror trial. And in the horror trial, we only had a, uh, a bone scan. Then we had the PSMA scans. And um, 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 we know that about 4% of these PSMA scans are completely negative. But that's, uh, that's not a problem anymore. Um, I'm sorry, I cannot share my slides anymore. So I will stop and we go on with, we go on with the, the next presentation. And we come back to the discussion. I had some nice slides, I think, but I cannot show them. Is it possible that uh, uh, Dr. Stefano Fanti is coming in? Yep, absolutely. I'm sorry that it was a bit messy, but it's uh, there was some some problem with my uh, with my slides. Uh, very much welcome, uh, Stefano. Um, I was trying to say that it's it's uh, there is a lot of discussion going on uh, about uh, PSMA scans or bone scan and, and CT scans. What shall we do? And uh, when I look into the guidelines, the guidelines are not very clear on this, eh? and they say that it's. Uh, uh, there are no outcome data uh, to inform subsequent management, so we don't do it. Uh, I'm not sure whether that's the right way, and I hope you can shed some lights on whether we should uh, use PSMA scans in uh, metastatic hormone-sensitive prostate cancer. Please, the floor is yours. Thank you very much. I um, hope your slides are working. <laughs> <laughs> well, we will immediately see if yeah. it's working. Uh, um, yes, I see them. Great, fantastic. So first of all, thank you very much. It's a great pleasure to be here. Uh, even if I just said that the, the title that you suggested for my talk, it's really challenging. Uh, one of the more challenge I have in the last year. So it's about imaging and uh, metastatic hormone sensitive prostate cancer. Is PSMA PET the preferred option? Uh, here are my disclosure, as you can see, are many, and I always used to say, be aware that the main disclosure is that I'm proudly a nuclear medicine physician, so you will have uh, a nuclear medicine point of view. Uh, my talk will go from the evolution, very briefly, of prostate cancer imaging to indications of a PSMA PET, and finally, we will come to the hormone-sensitive prostate cancer. Now, there are a number of imaging methods that have been suggested for prostate cancer in the last uh, 50 years, because indeed imaging, it, it's really old. And the story of imaging, as every good story, should start with the prehistory, that's to say what we had before. And to every extent, bone scanning introduced more than 50 years ago, it's really like cave paintings. Uh, well, honestly, maybe cave paintings have uh, really a better spatial resolution. Uh, so we tried to get better and we moved to some uh, images like Colline PET. Uh, now I say these are not 
impressive images, a rather impressionist image, uh, because they were definitely better than bone scanning, but not satisfactory at all. And finally, what we offer to you is PSMA imaging, which has a nice spatial resolution, a great target to background, and as said, they just uh, entered into the guidelines. For example, when it comes to biochemical recurrence, which is probably the main indication for PSMA PET, uh, is uh, being recommended in the EAU guidelines since 2019, either in patient uh, treated uh, surgically or after radiation therapy. Now the evidence is growing and it's becoming very strong. We have uh, about 25,000 articles published right now. Uh, so it's growing and growing the literature data. Uh, when it comes uh, to indication, uh, usually, these are the classical indication that I, I, I used to give talk about. And uh, uh, as you can see, they are based on, on clinical scenarios. So, uh, for example, diagnosis, I, I, I don't mean that PSMA can be used for primary diagnosis, but it's a question which is posed or staging or biochemical recurrence, persistent and therapy plan. Now, uh, for example, let's talk about PSA persistence. And that's an example from our, from our file. You can see how better is gallium PSMA as compared to coli. And we have guidelines stating that, for example, again, PSMA PET, it's recommending in this particular clinical scenario, that's PSA persistence. Now, which is the fact? The fact is that in those indications, what we have is primary data. It could be very robust primary data, just like for biochemical recurrence, or data suggesting to not use PSMA, like for primary diagnosis, but in any case, we have primary data. That's an example of primary data. Well, indeed, these are secondary data because it's a meta-analysis, but it's data regarding detection rate comparing the many different approaches from CT, bone scanning, and the different PET tracer. And that's the first prerequisite that you need to establish if a method is valued or not. The second point about those indications is that you have a very clear clinical question. So you have a problem immediately to solve. So for example, staging, should we only do local therapy or should we go for systemic therapies because there is something outside the prostatic bed? So there are mats. So there is a very, very clear clinical question. So you have data and question. And, and the solution is quite simple. I mean, we, we can draw some conclusion. Now, fact is that with the large availability of PSMA PET, there are some new possible in indications which are a bit more difficult to address. For example, non-metastatic CRPC, what we have, we have very, very few publications. In particular, for example, this very famous publication from the colleagues at UCLA and UCSF reporting about PSMA in men with non-metastatic CRPC. And what they observed that in the very large majority of patients, indeed PSMA PET was positive, and in more than half of the patient, they find localization outside uh, the prostatic bed despite negative conventional imaging. Now, does this as a direct impact on the patient of the management and result on major objective? Honestly, we don't know that. So we should rely on the opinion of the expert and, and the, the, probably the higher level it's at the APCC, the event which was held in Switzerland. And there was a specific question on that on the last meeting uh, is at the panelist, what imaging method are you using in M0 CRPC? And the opinion was 58% in favor, but that's again uh, uh, an expert opinion is not based on robust data. So more than half of the patients suggested they would use PSMA PET in M0 CRPC. Now, the topic that we're gonna to cover tonight is metastatic HSPC. There is just one paper that I've been able to find and published it really a few months ago, again, collaboration North America and Essen. And what they found is that PSMA PET is quite useful to discriminate the low volume versus the high volume of disease using PSMA PET. Now, how does this, reflect in the guidelines. Um, well, if we refer to the non-metastatic HSPC, it's clear that there is no need for imaging. What comes to the metastatic HSPC and guidelines? Well, first of all, it's mentioned, you have to take care about spinal cord compression. You have to take care about urinary tract complication, but these are not the domain of PSMA PET, it's the domain of other imaging method of MRI or, or conventional imaging. 
Another potential indication is a response of therapy in, in metastatic uh, HSPC. Uh, now, problems. If you are using bone scan, then you would need uh, a complicated, well, at least a not simple method to quantify that. And most of all, you have a lot of limitation with the flare phenomenon. And the conclusion is that uh, MRI and PET-CT should not be used for that scope. And uh, if you have absence of PSA right, so you really apparently have no reason to scan the patients, uh, you don't know which is the opti optimal timing and the best imaging modality to be used. It's completely unclear as defined by, by the guidelines. So again, what we can do, let's come back to the expert opinion. Let's come back to the APCC. Question, if the patient is presenting with the M1 high volume HSPC, would you use PSMA PET CT? Now, even the expert respond, no, we don't need it. It's already high volume. So what is the added value of PSMA PET CT? Only 18% will suggest it. What about the low volume? Well, again, it's a higher number, 32%, but again, the majority will stay with CT and bone scan. So let's move to some possible conclusion about imaging of metastatic uh, hormone sensitive PC and PSMA PET. Well, first of all, there's no doubt PSMA PET has been a game changer. It's been uh, an incredible impact on the management of patients. It's available. Uh, it's widely used, sometimes maybe even overused. But if it's about imaging of metastatic HSPC, we absolutely have no idea which is the best image modality, which is the optimal timing. And, and most of all, there is a clinical question, which is the ultimate reason for imaging? So my answer to the question is that uh, imaging is PSMA PET the preferred option. Well, I honestly absolutely don't know. But in favor of that, as quoting Socrates, the true wisdom is recognizing our own ignorance. And with that, I thank you for the attention. I thank Jaren for the, for the great question that he posed to me. Thank you very much. Well, thank you very much, Stefano. It's, it's clear, eh? we don't know. And that's maybe that's the, the, real, the real answer. It, uh, it is like that. And uh, we come back to later to the, uh, to the discussion. Um, maybe you can stop sharing. Yes, okay. Um, then I'll invite Professor Karim Fizazi um, from, yeah, can I say Paris or Fils Juif? Uh, both are good, I think. Eh? Um, you were going to talk about um, um, the medical treatment, and there's a lot going on eh, in the medical treatment of uh, MHSPC, and you're one of the proponents of the uh, triple therapy, and uh, I've been to the last, um, to the last ASCO GU, and you were there, you were there, of course, and um, there they showed that there were quite some treatment options, but they also gave some kind of a take-home message on which patient should we uh, use the triple therapy. And there they said only the high-volume de novo cases, but I, I, undoubtedly you will come back to, uh, to that. So I'm very happy that you are, uh, that you are here, and um, please share your thoughts on the, uh, on the treatment, on the medical treatment of MHSPC. Sure. Thank you, Jaron. Uh, let me share not only my opinion, but also my screen. Well, those are patients, you don't need that. Uh, all right. So uh, the question was really, um, should we intensify men with metastatic castration sensitive prostate cancer? And thank you again for the opportunity. Uh, those are my disclosures. Oops, sorry, let me give you some time. And uh, before I move to systemic treatment, I want to remind people that we have level one evidence to support intensified local treatment with radiation therapy in men with metastatic castration sensitive disease and uh, low burden. So in other words, approximately less than three bone metastases. And this comes from the stampede phase three trial where overall survival was significantly improved for these men, not for men with a high burden disease, uh, similar actually to what was reported in the Dutch uh, HORA trial, which uh, mostly uh, included these men with high burden disease. But for those with low burden disease, please remember local treatment with radiation 
is a, a standard treatment now. Regarding systemic treatment, we've been using androgen deprivation therapy for decades, believe it or not, from approximately 1940s when ADT was invented in Chicago to the mid 2010, so say seven years ago, ADT alone was the standard treatment. The stack cell shown improvement uh, on top of ADT for phase three trials look at the question. Two of them were positive, charted, uh, which I guess is famous, and one arm of Stampede, while two other uh, uh, phase three trials, GTIC 15, and another arm of Stampede that actually nobody speaks about, was less convincing for overall survival, although uh, PFS was uh, significantly improved in all these four trials. The meta-analysis that was conducted uh, six years ago supported a 23% reduction in the risk of death, and thus became standard of care at this time. Now, having said that, with a longer follow-up in actually all these trials, it appears that the benefit was lower than initially reported, especially in charted, uh, which initially reported a 40% reduction in the risk of death. And with longer follow-up, it was actually only 28%, so much more in line with what was reported in JETIC 15 and Stampede. And also the same data was reported in long-term analysis of Stampede 19% reduction in the risk of death only. So the start cell improves OS, true, but perhaps less than initially reported, probably max 20% uh, in, in patients with MCSPC. Now, starting in 2017, we saw the first readouts of trials looking at next generation hormonal agents, first with aberatron, and as you can see in both the latitude and stampede phase three trial, there was clear demonstration that OS was significantly improved with approximately 35% reduction in the risk of death. In contrast to what was reported uh, with the stack cell, the longer term analysis showed actually that the benefit is maintained. Uh, with the stack cell, the covers merge uh, with time, which we don't see uh, in latitude or in stampede, as you can see here on the screen. And actually, the benefit remains almost exactly the same. Again, approximately 35% reduction in the risk of death, while many more patients in the control arm had access to a salvage treatment, including next generation hormonal agent. What I, I just said about aberratron was also demonstrated with uh, other uh, next generation hormonal agents, including enzalutamide and apalutamide. Of course, for the sake of time, I'm not going to detail all these uh, trials. Uh, most of you are probably familiar with them. You probably saw them many times in trial in, um, in congresses or, or publications. But it's truly really the consistency which is uh, uh, striking here. Uh, every trial will demonstrate the same data, approximately again, 35% reduction in the risk of death. Now, what are the questions? First, should the systemic treatment differ according to the metastatic burden? I told you that for radiation therapy, counting the metastasis makes a difference. Less than three bone metastases, yes, you should give radiation therapy. More than that, probably not, at least uh, for overall survival, there won't be a benefit. We don't really know whether we can uh, improve uh, local symptoms with radiation. But uh, for systemic treatments, does it make a difference? Should we count the, the metastasis and, and decide that this man, uh, we should receive intensification treatment, while this, this other man, maybe not? Regarding the stack cell, the first data from Chartered reported that indeed the stack cell may benefit to men with high volume disease. So, you know, to make it simple, patients with more than four bony metastases or visceral metastases, while patients with low volume may not benefit. But please remember that this was based on a subgroup analysis with a very small number of men in the low volume category. Uh, and they were basically comparing approximately 100 men versus 100 men. So we need to be careful. And on top of this, some of these men in uh, Chartered had relapsed from local uh, therapy 
and localized uh, prostate cancer. And we know that these patients, when they have low volume relapse, actually do much better. They tend to survive uh, eight years as a median as compared to only four years for other patients with de novo disease. So they, it might just be that we're not speaking about the same patient. And actually, when uh, Stampede investigators de decided to do the same analysis in their trial, which is made on only de novo, almost only de novo patients, it turned out that they could not find any difference uh, between, in terms of benefiting from the stack cell chemotherapy. As you can see here, patients with low volume have approximately 24% uh, reduction in the risk of death, while patients with high burden have approximately 19%. So, and, and of course, you may debate as to whether this is significant or not. They may, might just not have the power to, to show that. But you know, the trend is really the same. And there's no, there was no real reason in their trial to think that those tax cells should be given only to men with higher burden and not to low burden disease. What about uh, for with uh, next generation hormonal agents? Abiraterone was used in stampede in both men with low risk and high risk disease, while, while in latitude, we treated only men with high risk. And as you can see in, uh, in stampede, both men with low risk and high risk categories actually benefit tremendously from abiraterone treatment with a 45% reduction in the risk of death. So again, no, no real reason to count the metastasis to decide whether a patient should receive abiraterone, yes or no. And what I'm saying here with abiraterone was actually shown also with apalutamide or enzalutamide. So again, even if there is a DOP for the stack cell chemotherapy, depending on whether you trust more chartered or more stampede, um, you may say high volume only or all cameras, but for all the uh, next generation hormonal agents, basically it's all cameras, they all benefit from uh, abiraterone, apalutamide or enzalutamide. Okay, so we now have basically two new weapons when it comes to systemic treatments, hormonal agents and dostaxal chemotherapy. And until recently, we had to discuss for one of those two options. And, for, and to, to try to address this question about uh, treatment uh, choice, I'm using here a color code where you will see hormonal therapy shown in blue and chemotherapy shown in red. So let's see whether we have a winner. For overall survival, I know it's hard to compare trials, but here we have 10 trials or almost 10 randomized trials. And I've been ranking them from best to worst in terms of impact on overall survival benefit. And you will see that the best was Stampede Abiraterone with a 39% reduction in the risk of death. The worst was Jetup 15 with a 12% uh, non-significant actually benefit in the risk of death with the stack cell. And you will see that all the blue team is actually above and all the red team is actually below. There is one exception, or there actually was one exception, which was Arches initially reporting a 81% uh, or 19%, if you will, reduction in the risk of death only. But with longer term analysis, it turned out that Arches is now coming together with the, the other blue team, if you will, so the uh, other phase three trials looking at next generation hormonal agents. So basically all hormonal agents improve OS with a 35% plus or minus reduction in the risk of death, chemo more 20%, which actually is in line with what we saw in CRPC with these agents. So it's not a big surprise to me, to be honest. And it really seems that a hormonal therapy is a winner in terms of overall survival, with the caveat that we don't necessarily have a direct comparison for us. And when you're looking at the other uh, criteria, uh, actually PFS is clearly better with next generation hormonal agents. And actually this was even shown directly in Stampede with Abiraterone versus the stack cell. Quality of life and even the symptomatic effect is actually better with next generation hormonal agent. Toxicity also, 
of all survival, I've just mentioned it, actually only cost is favoring the stag cell. And actually I may say worse because Abiratron is now becoming a generic drug, even in Europe, and it is already in most countries worldwide. So I guess we clearly have a winner in this battle between the two family of agents, and I think it's truly next generation hormonal agents. Having said that, the current question is actually, shouldn't these agents, Abiratron or the other AR drugs and chemo play together? And I'm saying that, of course, because they don't necessarily have cross resistance, mechanisms of, of action are different, and also safety is not necessarily an issue, at least with some of them, because the, the toxicity is really different. And there might be synergy actually in the lab. This is really why we decided to design Peace One. And Peace One is, a, it is an academic European phase three trial that asks basically two questions. Should we use an intensified uh, uh, treatment, systemic treatment with ADT, Dostaxel, and Abiratron? And number two question, should we also use radiation therapy directed to the primary in a context where you're using intensified systemic treatment? Regarding the uh, radiation therapy question, we don't have the answer as I'm speaking because we're focusing on men with oligometastic disease, so low volume, if you will. And of course, these men take their time before they relapse and eventually die from the disease. So we need more evidence before we do the analysis for the radiation therapy question. But for the systemic treatment, we do have the answer. And actually it's a yes answer. If you're using ADT plus dostaxel plus abiratron, men will live longer as compared to ADT plus the stack cell with a 25% reduction in the risk of death. As you can see here, the median is even not rich in the triplet uh, combination arm versus approximately four and a half year in the ADT the stack cell control arm as expected for this man. Of course, the, the benefit is even bigger if you're focusing on men with uh, high volume disease RPFS, massive benefit, one and a half year in the control arm versus more than four years without cancer progression in the intensified arm, overall survival, 3.5 years in the control arm versus more than five years in the um, intensified arm. So very clear difference for this man. If I'm trying to put this data into uh, context, basically five or seven years ago, when we were using ADT alone, these men with de novo high volume disease would die with a median of less than three years, unfortunately. Very consistent across trials, by the way. Chartered, Vegetic 15, Stampede, 34 months approximately. So basically less than three years of survival. The Staxel improved survival to approximately 43 months. Again, very consistent across trials. Abiratron up 50 months plus. And now with the triplet treatment, it's more than five years for these men, again, with high volume and de novo, so the worst uh, disease you can imagine for, for these men. In just less than a decade, we've moved from a median of less than three years to a median of more than five years, which I think is a fantastic achievement. Of course, when you're looking at these two hours, you need also to make sure that patients in the control arm were treated according to whether they should be treated. And here in piece one, I can say that indeed they were. In the control arm, more than 80% of the total who progressed actually had access to a next generation hormonal therapy, which is probably a first. In, in the previous trials, mostly pharma sponsored, this was not the case. And it's really the first time we have a trial where you're clearly randomizing early versus deferred treatment and not necessarily early versus maybe. And, it, and the answer is that early is actually better. Also very important is to make sure that we're not arming patients. And this is also the good news from PS1. Actually, the triplet treatment is very well tolerated 
as compared to the tablet, no more neutropenia, no more febrile neutropenia, only hypertension 20% versus 13% and liver toxicity with 6% versus one and all the rest is just even. So this is a quite safe uh, triplet combination. That was not the case with enzalutamide, for example, in the enzymatrol, where there was clearly more uh, toxicity with a triplet. This is now confirmed with a second trial, Aracens, which clearly and directly randomized ADT plus dose tag cell versus the same plus darolutamide. Very large trial, 1,300 uh, uh, men were randomized very clear um, randomization process and very clear data. Overall survival is also very clearly uh, improved, approximately four years in the control arm versus not even reached in the combo arm with darolutamide, 32% reduction in the risk of death. And of course, this came together with all secondary endpoints being met and a very nice safety uh, profile actually almost no detectable additional toxicity from darolutamide on top of ADT plus stag cell. So I think the take home message for men with M1 castration sensitive disease is as follows. For men with de novo high volume, we should start using a triplet treatment right now. If a patient is fit with ADT plus stag cell aberration and hopefully darolutamide when it's approved and reimbursed. Of course, some patients are unfit for the stag cell or they don't want the stag cell chemo, but they need to be informed, at least those who don't want, that this might be detrimental to them. And in that case, ADT and an next generation hormonal agent is a reasonable option, of course, for these men. For men with de novo low volume, I would say at least ADT, next generation hormonal agent, and radiation therapy directed to the primary should be standard of care. And we shall discuss the triplet systemic treatment on a one-by-one -one basis. Perhaps younger patients feed those with bone metastasis when sometimes it's hard to count the metastasis. If you have a large pelvic bone metastasis, is that just one met or is that one, two or three? I of course don't know. And the, the, metal, the, the prognosis of these men might be similar to that of high volume disease. Men with relapse, ADT person next generation hormonal agent is probably uh, the current standard of care. These patients were rare in all randomized trials that I just mentioned to you. There was a subgroup of these men in our essence, and actually they seem to benefit from the triplet treatment, but it's a small subgroup in our essence, so hard to say whether it's a true finding, of course. Frail, very elderly patients exist, of course, and sometimes by default, you still have to use ADT alone, but this has to be justified really based on frailty. And finally, the next generation trial should now stratify patients based on clinical and molecular biomarkers. This is, for example, what we're doing in the P6 program, which is starting in Europe, where we are looking at, for example, at oligometastic men with randomization regarding whether we should use radiation therapy directed to metastasis, vulnerable population, where we are randomizing the role of darolutamide. Patients with BRCA are actually included in a pharma trial looking at the role of PARP inhibitors, and also men with poor PSA responders by six to eight months, we are about to, to launch a new trial looking at whether we should intensify these men who are not good responders with low PSMA. And with us, I thank you for your kind attention. And of course, I'm very happy to take questions. Thank you. Well, thank you very much, Karim. That was a, a very nice overview on uh, on MHSPC, what to do. And I think the, the last slides are very important. Uh, what is your uh, your take home message? What should we uh, do? Um, so we have two subjects tonight. We have the imaging and we have the treatment and what to do. And um, when I combine these, uh, Karim, when I ask you, do you use the PSMA scan? Do you use PSMA scan in this phase of the uh, of the patient? My answer is that currently I do in patients with 
evidence of oligometastatic disease or large volume, whatever you call it, yeah. uh, are by conventional imaging. So if a patient comes to me or if I see a patient who is at risk for, for metastasis based on his PSA, uh, decent score, um, etc., I would mostly order a conventional imaging, generally speaking, but if he's an oligoman based on conventional imaging, then I would do a PSMA PET or choline PET by default in France, depending on what's available, because we want to have this information before we randomize all the patients in P6 oligo, which is randomizing the role of uh, radiation directed to metastasis. And I think next generation imaging is needed to provide the current and future evidence. So when I understand you well, for you, it's important to know the volume of uh, the metastasis, the number of the metastasis. Eh? And Stefano, you can help us with this. Eh? Um, is it, um, we, we know the PSMA scan, we find a lot of metastasis, sometimes very small, tiny ones. And are these the ones that we also would have been finding on a bone scan or a, just a regular CT scan? I don't think so. So we have to, how can we recount what we have seen on the PSMA to, to the older studies? Is, that, is there any possibility? Uh, well, we may consider running all those nice trials from the very beginning. So let's start new Chartier, new Stampede. Uh, <laughs> I don't think it's so feasible, no, but no. most likely it would be wise in the future to incorporate PSMA PET into a stratification factor or... Uh, uh, again, as you properly said, first of all, we have to clarify to ourselves uh, which is the goal of imaging. As Karim nicely stated, uh, if you are a patient where you are planning a metastasis-directed therapy, you have to be sure that you are treating all the metastases and you're not missing anyone, any, 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 any lesion. And that's why it's important to see even small ones. So that's an indication, but you have to have clear which are the consequences of what you're doing. Uh, when you're mentioning stratification by low volume and high volume, again, we have absolutely no proof that the new stratification based on PSMA will have an impact on survival. So you have to build up this evidence because demonstrating that PSMA is correlated with the old fashioned CT and bone scan is quite useless because you just don't need to reply it. You have to add something. And, and it's not really about finding one more lesion in, in a gentleman that have already 15 lesions, but rather to measure the volume of the disease with the more sensitive methods. That's the goal. How, how, how do you measure this? It was one question on the SUV value. Can we, can we learn something about the SUV value? Um, is that helpful? Uh, no, helpful? in that case, no. SUV, you can measure the SUV on every single lesion. Uh, yeah. It's a measure of the intensity of the uptake, essentially. So you can have SUV max, SUV mean, but it, it's okay. a measure of how hot is the lesion or how avid, we used to say, is the lesion. But there are software systems which will multiply the intensity of uptake for the volume, by the volume. So you calculate a tumor burden. Uh, which is now done automatically. So it's not operator dependent. And that's the way that PET will give you a measure of the volume of the disease with an index that is called uh, um, tumor volume or, well, in some cases called metabolic tumor volume, even if PSMA is not a metabolic tracer. So it's not exactly the perfect definition. Yeah. Okay, but we, we have to learn about this. I, I saw that in the P6, there is also an arm with lutetium and there you should have at least some SU value to use lutetium, isn't it? Yep. Um, well, there are some questions on, on docetaxel and uh, is docetaxel alone uh, uh, not an indication anymore? Can we, uh, should we not use docetaxel alone with ADT anymore? Uh, I would say, indeed, we should not, unless uh, we are in a situation where a patient cannot have access or has a contraindication to a next-generation hormonal agent. I know that in many countries it remains expensive, and so patients cannot afford when they pay out of pocket. Uh, in those situations, the stack cell, of course, by default, remain uh, reasonable, but in, in situations and countries where a next-generation hormonal agent is of a label, I think indeed the stack cell alone is not any more appropriate. But in the piece one, it was it was standard of care, as was it said, and 
uh, and not in all countries, those taxes were standard of care. Uh, how did you do this in, in the piece one? How were you sure that patients did get in that standard of care, did get the dose of taxol? Oh, we, we, we clearly measured that. We, we captured the information. Uh, when we started the trial, ADT alone was the standard of care, but rapidly we amended the trial to allow for those tax cell and we stratified for those tax cell use in the trial. And actually we capture clearly the information. So uh, we I, actually, I think we have 700 plus patients who, who actually had those tax cell and we know very well, we have really very well the information. And there are also quite some questions on when we have low volume metastasis, should, should we treat that metastasis uh, by radiotherapy or whatever? And is that something we should add also? We don't know. We know we it's know. a ball. Uh, we don't have level one evidence. There are only small randomized phase two looking at this trial uh, with this question. Uh, and we are currently uh, questioning this in phase three trial, we have, for example, the P6 oligo uh, uh, trial currently occurring patients in Europe with probably more than 200 patients already randomized. I know Stampede wants to also uh, ask this question, but they haven't started yet, I think. Uh, I think Stampede, for example, doesn't require next generation uh, uh, imaging, and we do. And I think it's more appropriate, actually, as we just discussed it with Stefano. Uh, there, there is also a Canadian trial looking at this question, currently enrolling patients. So, so even if we don't have the answer right now, we will have it. And I think it's really appropriate to enroll patients in these trials. Yeah, it, it's really interesting. Um, there was a, a, a comment on the SWOC 1216. Do you know this trial? I don't know, with Arteronel. Right, yeah. Uh, yeah it, it was a negative it, study. It is. And uh, the question is, do you think the care after progression in the comparator arms matters in the MCSPC studies? So, um, yeah, can we learn anything from that trial? Yeah, I, I guess, I mean, Oternal is a weaker, if you will, CYP17 inhibitor as compared to abiratron. It actually failed already in two randomized phase three trials in CRPC. Uh, none of them could demonstrate uh, overall survival improvement. And actually there is more toxicity than what we saw with, uh, with Aberratron. So the best trial that, that this person is referring to is a third trial in castration sensitive disease. And again, we don't see overall survival improvement. So I think we should just not continue developing this, this agent. Okay. And there was also a question on, uh, is there really a benefit in starting immediate ADT in the frail or very old patients with low volume and SPC? Shouldn't we just wait and not maybe only give radiotherapy and not give this ADT in this old, uh, uh, very frail patients? I guess it's an excellent question. And it's probably a one by one uh, this decision. I guess in a patient with very low burden disease, um, you know, one or two meds, not dangerous. Uh, it might be indeed, you know, safe not to treat with ADT uh, in a very frail man uh, and consider only local treatments. Uh, now, in a patient with a more aggressive disease, either by biology, high glycine score, very rapidly rising PSA, or even a greater burden of a disease, I would still use a systemic treatment. If ADT is, is too much, it might be, you know, for example, bicalutamide sing, single agent, which also works. It's yeah. ideal, but it might be also a good compromise in a, if, in a frail gentleman. Yeah, sometimes they say that you can have cardiac complications, eh? but uh, we, we are, we're not sure about uh, that. Um, so the idea is that hit the patients with all you have in the same time, eh? but you can also argue that's why don't you give it in a sequence that you have every compound, you can have the effect of it. And well, in fact, we don't know. And piece one, we didn't try that. Well, we actually, we did because in the control arm, this is the sequential treatment was actually given. And, uh, and actually men who relapse receive salvage aberratron or anzalutamide and salvage the stag cell on top of you know, all the other treatments, cabalitax cell, et cetera. So they were actually treated uh, sequentially and aggressively. And actually the answer is that using these agents 
earlier works better. So we do have the evidence that intensified upfront okay. treatment is better. Okay, and we just have to wait the results of the radiotherapy arm eh? because that's also, I think that's very interesting uh, to see what's happening there. But you, you're selected there for the low volume patients, do I understand you well? Actually, people could use uh, or could also randomize their patients for, with both high volume and low volume. And this is number one because before because sorry, we didn't have the, the readouts from HORAD and Stampede radiation when we designed the trial and when we started enrolling patients. Number one reason and number two reason is because we also hope that even in men with high burden disease local radiation may actually prevent from the onset of bad prog local progressions. And this is something we're capturing very directly in the trial, not only of all survival, but also how many patients suffer from local progression in all these arms. So we will be able to address the question for both low volume and also high volume men. Okay, that's, that's very interesting. And and the one million dollar question, of course, is can we also use enzalutamide in this, uh, and maybe darolutamide uh, in this case? Because you 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 used uh, abiraterone, but can we replace that with some, some other compound? Well, regarding uh, enzalutamide, you might have some uh, better insight. Maybe I'd ask this here. Uh, I think the enzametrol is being updated very soon. Maybe ASCO, maybe ESMO, I don't know. Uh, but we, we should have more data with enzalutamide ADT dose taxel. For the combination with radiation, I don't think we'll, we will have data. And the same applies for darolutamide. We have data from our essence with ADT dose taxel, but we don't have data with radiation. That's very true. Yeah. Okay, well, we have to wait. I hope you will publish your data soon because it's until now, we have only seen an abstract, and uh, I'm, I think it, it's, you're working on it, of course. Yeah, actually, I'm happy to say that the paper is in press in the Lancet Journal, and I can okay. say it publicly because the Lancet Journal allows me to say it publicly. Okay, then we we'll all, yeah. we'll all have to look it up. Do you have a question, Stefano? And... No, no, I was just complimenting Karim for another okay. great achievement. Okay, well, that's very good. Um, we are 18 past uh, seven, so we, are, uh, we have no time anymore. And I want to thank you both very much for these interesting two uh, presentations we had in this webinar. I'm sorry that we started a bit uh, messy with my presentation, but okay, we finally came out there. And of course, I want to thank also uh, Bayer. Bayer is giving an educational grant, and uh, they had no involvement in the in the program. We can we can say this, uh, this but I'm very happy that they uh, supported this and they support the ESU. Um, thank you very much, and I hope to see you somewhere in the world, uh, in the urological world or the prostate world or whatever. And um, have a nice uh, evening. Thank you very much. Thank, thank you so much. Bye. Bye.